I think I was a pioneer for hope. My early days in Jamaica were very, very happy, but, you know, just very, very disciplined. So coming to England, the home of football, I was really excited. to the left wing for Sudbury Court for six months. And that's obviously when the taxi driver was driving by, saw a game, come on, watch this game, there's this kid. A supporter, in fact, phoned up the club and said that a friend of his had seen a young boy that he thought was well worth watching. He was recommended to us by a taxi driver who spoke to one of our scouts and said, you ought to go see this young boy playing for Sudbury Court. His name is Barnes. We saw him, we gave him half a game. <laughs> we hid him <laughs> and signed him <laughs> as quickly as we could. You don't need to be an expert, you see. Barnes. <laughs> well, he showed that to Donaghy. Oh, my goodness! And running in by Barnes! We've seen enough skill from young John Barnes today. His potential is really something quite extraordinary. It's 70. Robson was due to take his team on tour to Brazil. And we went with a young, inexperienced side, one being John Barnes. If you'd like to score a marvellous goal, where would you like to score it? Against Brazil and American Earth? For sure. John Barnes on the left side, comes inside Leandro. He could let one go here. He certainly could let one go. He keeps it on his right foot. He's gone all the way through. What a brilliant goal by John Barnes. That was quite magnificent. That's, that's forever. That's for immortality. So it was one of the greatest goals I've ever seen in my life. He threatened, he teased, he cajoled the defence. That is a magnificent way to open your scoring career for England. What a fine goal. As a 20-year-old in June 1984, Barnes scored a fantastic individual goal against Brazil in Rio. The great Pelé described it as the best he'd ever seen. From a young age, that obviously elevated my status and the expectation and the expectancy level then increased tenfold. Uh, and I was expected to do that every time I got the ball. Something really rather nasty, but he doesn't... Uh... Incredibly, England were beating Brazil in Rio. Goes then it just got silly. Forward opportunities now for Barnes. Can he get his centre in? Oh, yes, he can. Good one to Hakley. And Hakley gets ahead. And Hakley has scored. It's Maracanã. It's carnival time. But the party belongs to England. It's England 2, Brazil 0. It was a fantastic day for England and John Barnes. The flight home the next day was not. Well, there are four or five national fronts agitated, if that's what you want to call them, shouting out abuse and stuff like that. I mean, it was just general. I can't even remember anything specific that went on, but we got the gist of it. They were shouting in the plane that England had not won 2-0 that day, but they had won 1-0, and they completely discounted the goal by John Barnes. I mean, how sick can you be? I was told that, you know, by non-certain terms, by some people who were there, that I shouldn't be playing for England, and we only beat Brazil 1-0 because you scored, and black people shouldn't play for England. But that didn't dampen my thirst for wanting to play for England at all. As they arrived back at Heathrow, the England squad seemed unconcerned about the National Front taunts which had been aimed at their two coloured players, Mark Chamberlain and John Barnes. Yeah. I'd be a bit astonished to get it in, in international football, but I mean, you just have to put up with it. It just seemed to be an awful long way to go as well to, for that sort of behaviour. Did it surprise you? So 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 far? Well, the majority went just to support England, but it's just That's a few. Right. Really put put That's right, the majority are, are okay, but it's just a, a few. Nothing, generally speaking, in football or life generally surprises me. You know, we would like it all to be a lovely, happy place, but that's not the reality of it. And uh, so I understood that's the reality of, of some people's lives and some people's existence and, and the way people are. On the plane, we had a couple of National Front members out there and they were saying that we only won one nil because you'd scored the goal and stuff like that. But we ignored them. This was just the way it was, completely accepted by everyone. The abuse, the name calling, all you could hear were the hoo-hoos, the nigger chants. When did you first encounter racism on the football pitch? Probably my first game for Watford, I would think. At certain grounds, we had to suffer from racist abuse. That was terrible. The crowd are booing John Barnes. I hope he's not going to be spoiled by that sort of thing. If it's a problem with it, John's race, it was not half the problem that they had when I'm trying to play football against him. 
done from John Barnes. Brilliant goal! Is football racist? No more than anywhere else. Or no less than anywhere else. Two years later, John Barnes was in England's World Cup squad in Mexico. But Barnes was an outsider looking in. A substitute in every match until the last 16 minutes of the quarter-final against Argentina. Belatedly, Bobby Robson decided to use his talents. By now, England were on the way out. Two down to Argentina, one scored by Maradona's hand of God. A hopeless situation, but a magnificent World Cup debut for Barnes. And look at this from Barnes and Lineker! Bobby Robson was widely criticised for delaying the introduction of Barnes until it was a desperate, late gamble. What an impact he made. He almost laid on an equaliser as well. Beardsley, they're looking for Barnes all the time. He's brought a new dimension to the England play when they so badly needed it. Another cross, Lineker! So nearly another goal! We'd had him six years, for goodness sake. We couldn't keep him anymore. He was too good for us. He had to go. When Liverpool showed the interest, then I was quite prepared to do the deal with Liverpool. I'm glad that my six years at Watford was with Graham Tain in terms of the way he actually brought me up. A manager who really believed in you and who, in many respects, was very similar to my father. Liverpool wanted to sign in January and I didn't come to the July. So, of course, there was a bit of talk in the stand between January and July about John Barnes. He snubbed us, he turned us down, black players can't make it, they're not good enough, so we don't want him to come. Barnes fights to win over Anfield fans. I'll do my best for them, pledge new signing, John. Did you get hate mail before you signed for Liverpool? I got a few letters, yes, saying, you know, you black this, you shouldn't be playing for Liverpool, blah, blah, blah. And here I am, outside Anfield, signing autographs. It would have been quite nervous for me at this time, trying to, you know, as it says, win over the fans. Culturally, you know, where you live, you don't really see it. And then coming to Liverpool, I saw how separate the communities were. I was completely unaware that that was even there. So it just goes to show how much apathy people had towards it back then. If John Barnes fails somewhere like Liverpool, I feel that puts us back. I don't know how much chances we would have got ourselves, how much longer that would have taken for us to get through to that level if someone like John Barnes doesn't go to Liverpool and produce like he did. When I talk about mass racism, I'm talking about the amount of people. But it really seemed as if it was like the whole stadium, which was, uh, you know, hurling abuse. It's very hard that you've got someone here screaming stuff at you to the point where spit's coming out of their mouth. They're that angry. You think that that's just blanked out. You blank it out because you're being professional and you're getting on with it, but you, you walk off and you, you're thinking about that. I had experienced it before, equally as, as horrific, but not in those numbers. There would have been an element who would have wanted him to fail. Oh, absolutely. Of course there was. There would have been an element who were thinking he won't be tough enough to play at a club like Liverpool. Is that what we're talking about? Absolutely what we're talking about. That would only have encouraged them. 
How did he deal with it? Brilliantly. It kind of looks kind of staged, as if, you know, because the whole image of me kicking the banana looks like it's a setup. So it's a very poignant image. In a high profile game, this then was shocking to people who hadn't seen it. That's when the whole kick racing amount of football thing really started. Ian Wright says that for him, you were the pioneer. Obviously, they're looking at it different to me. I'm looking at it and thinking, it's about time, possibly, but it should have been sooner. But there has to be a catalyst, and many believe you were that catalyst. Good for them. <laughs> Good for them. He's really a fantastic example for people to follow, the way that he conducted himself on the pitch. No matter how much hate mail he got, or no matter how much abuse he was going to receive, no one was ever going to get one over on John Barnes. It never affected me at all. I have been a fully empowered and enfranchised young man growing up, and I would never let anyone try and disenfranchise me by throwing a banana at me. I think he tried to deal with it as a professional footballer in the right way. He used to just go out and, in the end, make the same people who have made those gestures, those noises towards them, end up clapping them off. You produce the goods. That's the way you stuff it down their throats. Even the Liverpool fans who were doing a racial abuse before he got there, they got in line and realised that they're dealing with top, top draw. Barnes. Beersley back to Barnes again. And Aldridge! A magnificent goal! Beersley, Barnes, Aldridge, simply unstoppable. Where do you place that Liverpool team that Kenny built? The best for me. That was the team that I'd love to have played in. And it was Barnes, he was the instigator, really. He was the, he was the man at the front and he was, he was the main man who did everything. When he'd move with the ball, it was so fluid. It was like liquid. If I was playing with John Barnes, my first thought was when I've got the ball is to give it to John Barnes. And that's probably what his Liverpool teammates thought. Ball, Barnes. Oh, Barnes, lovely bit of play. Oh, lovely play by Barnes. Now, the little cross to finish it off. It's in there! For us, he brought poise, he brought real, real quality. He could go and take it up to people, go past people, play other people in. Barnes showing that he can tackle as well. And pass it, we know he can do that. He could do everything. He had the pace, the crossing, the finishing. Barnes. Oh, my word! What can you do about that? Being strong, being organised, but being full of flair. He was just magical. That's what they call him, the magical John Barnes. At his best, how good was he? The best. He's a devoted dad with two lovely sons, Jamie and Jordan. The family home is in Hertfordshire. Susie's the lady in John's life. And she's Away from football, John set up home with Susie Bicknell. They've been together ever since his early Watford days. There were four sisters, you know, all of similar ages, and I didn't meet Susie till about four. I met her sisters before I met her. Uh, she's older than me, as maybe you would have gathered, you know. I don't know if I'm much of a toy boy, but... <laughs> she's only a couple of years older than me. But, uh, you know, then we started seeing each other, going out together, started living together when I was about 20, 19, you know and uh, I've got two lovely boys, Jamie and Jordan. And that's my home. The family home is in Hertfordshire. John also uses a flat in Liverpool and commutes to Merseyside. 
Susie certainly isn't an avid reader of the small print on the sports pages. Has that helped John in any way? I think probably it has in the end because uh, he gets so much football, everybody wants to talk football to him and um, I'm really not interested, I must say, at all in football. Um, it's a change for him, I think, to find someone who doesn't actually want to talk about football or listen to it. How much uh, of the game does he bring back here when he's had a bad game, for example, or when he's been criticised? Uh, does, he, does he bring the game back into no, the front room? No, he doesn't, not at all. No, it's something that he's never done. I've never mentioned it. Um, if he's had a good game or a bad game, he's exactly the same. I mean, sometimes, now and again, I'll actually ask him what the score was. And he'll say, oh, really? You know. But um, no, never mentions it at all. It's something that's completely separate. It's nice to get away from football come home, play with the kids, and it's not like, oh, Dad, you know, we were at the match with you today, and blah, 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 this and that, this and that. You know, football very rarely enters, enters my home life at all, you know, apart from kids wanting to kick football, which is, which is only natural anyway for all, for all the kids. I think if there's one thing that annoys you about John, it is the fact he gives away his England shirts all the time. <laughs> he's, so, he's generous to a fault, let's put it that way. He's actually given away all of his England shirts now, so don't anyone ask me for any England shirts, because we don't have any. I did have one that I saved and I had tucked away, and uh, he realised I actually had it tucked away and stole it from me the other week. So we actually haven't got any now at all. He's given them all away. That's naught out of nearly 60, isn't it? Well, yes, that's right, yeah. But they've all gone to very good worthwhile funds, raised a lot of money. They're jeered at Wembley for a long time like John Barnes has been here. Hey, hey, you're talking about another human being, so just watch your language, all right? I they're hammering him, aren't they? You know, I tell you what, actually, it does show the influence of newspapers, though, with these, with the Daily Mirror articles and the Sun article. She told me she had been raped, but she handled the situation of the rape in the most extraordinary way. But my immediate reaction was, I asked, did, they, did she know who it was? No. What color were they? She said it was a black person. I went up and down areas with a cosh hoping I'd be uh, approached by somebody. I'm ashamed to say that. And I did it for maybe a week, hoping some black bastard would come out of a pub and have a go at me about something, you know, so that I could kill him. Let's hear from the audience, the man in the blue jacket. John. Um with regard to racism, I recently heard you supporting comments made by Liam Neeson. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering whether you still stand by this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because... So these were, should we just uh, remind people, these are comments by Liam Neeson who was promoting his film, and he was talking about an incident of a, a friend of his who had apparently been raped. She said she was raped by someone who was black, and he said that it made him feel that he wanted revenge, and he went out and, and, and for a week or so... Yeah. So first of all, you he have to... Just, he wanted to look for... Hope, was hoping someone black, anyone yeah. black, would pick a fight with him and that he would, he would kill so, them. So, so first of all, you have to listen to the context in terms of what he was and, and the nuanced uh -huh. conversation that took place. He was talking about the act of revenge. So let's get the idea of, of a race out of it just to begin with. He's talking about, his film is about revenge. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the act of revenge and how it can eat you up. How it's all-encompassing and, <clears throat> and how it's a terrible feeling. So he started talking about Northern Ireland. He started talking about the problems that they had when he was growing up in Ireland. He then veered away from that to talk about an incident of revenge that affected him. Now, as he said, it happened to have been a black person. So therefore, the, 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 the feeling of revenge he felt was against any black person. Now, as he said, and I believe him, had it been a Lithuanian, had it been a Frenchman, it would have been against any Frenchman. It happened to be black. So after one week or how many other days of going around, he then felt horrified and ashamed of the way it actually made him feel. So then he sought help, and then he obviously... So the whole idea that he's racist because he's, he wanted to kill black people per se, and I'll tell you what he didn't mention, which is very important, is if you look at an, a, an Irish friend of mine explained it to me, when you are been brought up in Northern Ireland, and we can see the problems that may, through Brexit, may or may not happen, and he's aware of that, when something happens in, to a member of your religion, if you're Catholic, then your vitriol, your hatred is to any Protestant or any Catholic if it happens to a Protestant. Not the particular one who actually 
implemented the, the hurt on that person. So that is why I'm talking about the feeling that he actually had is a feeling of revenge and he had feelings of remorse. He had those feelings for one week. Now, why I have to give him credit is because as much as we all want to say we view people as equal, we don't and we have to admit it because we are influenced by our environment and the environment he came from, albeit from a Catholic and Protestant point of view, is whoever the enemy is, we have to kill the enemy. The enemy at that particular time happened to be black but it equally could have been English, and he would have wanted to kill any Englishman. So, but those holier than thou who says how terrible it is, it's a disgrace. What is the truth about the way we all feel about people of different races, different religions? We all discriminate, and we have to admit it. And not only do we admit it, why I'm happy to say that I, am an un I discriminate unconsciously is because the environment I've been brought up in that shows me that, and it continues to show me that. You read the newspapers every day and you hear about Muslim terrorists and, and Nigerian um, gangs, and that gives you a negative impression, not just of terrorists and of conmen or gangs, but also Nigerians and Muslims. And this is the influence that society has on us. So we can't help the way we've been brought up, and unless we are going to be able to have the conversation, rather than as soon as we mention anything, say, you're racist, you discriminate, but we don't. But that's not the reality, because if I was to ask you now, if you had a choice of to who you had to live next to, between, a, a, I don't know where you're from, um, between a, a, anybody, a Muslim and a white, you would have an opinion based on the, the way you've been brought up. Mm -hmm. But we won't admit it, because we're afraid of being called racist. So yep. that is why I agree with you. Joy, but then again can be painful For love 
love ain't a game. You know it ain't a game. So if I gave my heart to you, what would you do with it? Would you tear it apart? Or would you look after it? If I gave my heart to you, what would you do with it? Would you tear it apart? Or would you treasure it? If I gave my heart to you What if I gave my heart